Today on Clear Your Clutter Inside and Out, we're talking about having a good death. Are you interested in learning what a successful death is? Do you wonder if dying can be good or at least the best it can be? How can you take a positive approach to death? Learn about preparing for a good death as we begin our month focusing on beginnings and endings. Does your clutter own you? Unclear your clutter inside and out. We'll teach you how to become aware of your clutter along with action steps to declutter and create the life you desire. Come on, let's get started. Hey everyone, happy December. At the end of this month, I will have done 426 episodes. That's more than one day for a year. I have been podcasting since September 2014. My mother's death has made me reevaluate some things. It inspired today's episode. I am going to not do the podcast anymore. Now, a couple things. First of all, we'll have you have this whole catalog. For those on Patreon, I am going to switch how I'm doing that. What I figured out is I don't want to just do bonus episodes for Patreon. I want people to take action. I don't want to just put this content out and have people download it and wonder, oh, are they actually changing? Now, a lot of you have reached out to me, which I really appreciate. I want to create a world where I live in. We all need to be sharing our gifts with the world. So it's time for me to focus on people who are ready to take action. And so at the beginning of the year in January next month, the Patreon account is going to focus on giving you a weekly assignment, offer an affordable $5 a month. That's the basic plan. And then we go up from there if you want more interaction and detailed coaching with me. And so I'm switching the Patreon account that way. And for those not on Patreon, I'm going to release all the extra episodes that were beginning in March that were on Patreon and that people have not listened to on the broader iTunes and so forth. My mother's death made me realize, well, one, I'm, I'm tired. One, I want to, as I've mentioned, that I want to work with people who are ready to make change and take action. I just, my mother's death really made me realize, you know, I'm halfway through my life. I got stuff I need to do. I want to tell two books, write two books about personal stories in my personal life. I have a draft of another book I'm working on that kind of got sidetracked and hopefully maybe then the next year I'll get that out. That takes time and energy and doing the podcast takes an incredible amount of time and energy, which I was happy to do. I wanted to give back the way that if you didn't have access to someone, you, if you really motivated, give you take actions, you can do that. So it's just made me realize I've got less than half my life left. I want to write more and focus on that. I did manage to have a and book coming out at the end of the month I'm super excited about and end of the year, end of the month, the beginning of the year, but it'll be out. And it's going to be on a quick start, a 21 day challenge to declutter your life. I did that and beta tested it and got some feedback. And that's if you're super overwhelmed, this really breaks it down really gently and easily. So again, beginning of January, I'll release the previously unreleased episodes. When we get all done with that, you have 426 episodes. I haven't decided because that's going to take me to spring. And then I think after that, all the episodes I did were brand new. I didn't repurpose anything. But I think what I'm going to go through is repurpose some content, freshen it up. And at this point, that's the plan to continue with the podcast. If you're really ready to change your life, check out my Patreon group, The Color Your Life with Julie Caraccio. That's going to be where my main focus is now instead of doing the podcast to support people moving forward. So today's episode was inspired by both, both of my parents. My father planned, and I know that I've talked about this before, that what got me interested in end of life organizing and I thought that both my parents planned, but my mom didn't. She was afraid to die. And so we had to make some decisions after she died. For example, we cremated her. My dad said they had conversations about that. I know that you can have a good death, 
my goal was to have my mom die at home and to be with her. And I accomplished that. My father had shared with me later. He said, if you hadn't come home, I was going to have to take her to Liza's place, which we're very fortunate here. It's a really wonderful hospice place, but my mom wanted to stay at home. I knew that and grateful that I was able to accomplish that. And considering everything she went through, like having aphasia, she had I would what I would consider a good death. Now, of course, we, no one wants to be ill. She slept mainly the final three days and would open her eyes occasionally. We were there with her when she passed, holding her hand. She looked up, and at this time, I didn't realize she was blind. Her eyes were opaque. Is that the word I want to say? You know, just uh, white and had a film on them. And hearing is the last thing to go, which I kind of laughed because my mother has hear a pin drop from a thousand yards. And we were with her. And the thing, it was a really incredible experience. I felt angels and the room was crowded with people welcoming her to the other side. I've never been with someone they died. And a couple of weeks after my mom went to her next adventure, I was really upset. I was really missing her in that day. And I'd taken my niece to improv class and they had, I love those free little libraries and I'm hoping to get one in my neighborhood. I figure I can convince my husband to build one. And so there was this messages that people give right before they die. And I thought, oh, I need to read this. And I just read the intro and they talked about the presence of angels. I don't know if, when everything was happening, if I could, I think probably I knew there were angels, but they said that they look eight feet tall. And looking back, I'm like, huh, I probably would have said eight feet tall. I wasn't thinking as I'm with my mom, oh, these, this energy looks eight feet tall. And then the other thing, whatever the exact phrase I heard was something along the lines of, it's time for your mom to go. It's time for her to go. And this exact phrase was in the book. So that just for me was a little confirmation. She's okay. She's on the other side. And as I record this, I'm taking a grief class with Barrett and Beth. And if you haven't listened, I have a couple interviews with them. I'd encourage you to check those out. And it's been super helpful in processing my grief. But that was just another reminder, you know, I have to let go of my life to open up and create the life I desire. And so that's another reason for ending the podcast. Today's episode was also inspired by numerous stories I've heard about people who didn't plan for death, refused to acknowledge or avoid it. And I have this theory that plastic surgery is at one level trying to stave off death. We're so afraid of dying that we try to dip into that fountain of youth. I've never dedicated any episodes, but there's a first time for everything, right? And as I'm wrapping up, might as well go for it. This episode's dedicated to my mom, who I miss every day. This episode is also dedicated to Laura Carter, who is a fabulous neighbor and knew my grandmother's house was for sale and, and got that for us, who not only to helping us get our house, was a rock star, helped organize meals for my friends, from friends from my mom and my parents. She tended to my mom's garden. I mean, anyone who's going to weed for you weekly, that's a true friend. She did a weekly Zoom session with my mom and Lynn Companion to help with speech because my mom had aphasia. She, if she felt the caregivers weren't doing something or cleaning up, she said, hey, this needs to happen. And each time she felt my mom needed to be advocated for, she did that. And they've been friends, gosh, I don't know, has it been 50 years? And I am very grateful for them. We're blessed to have them as neighbors. But Laura Carter was truly a rock star and words in this small dedication won't even begin to thank her. I also want to thank everyone who brought meals, just was really great for my family. We had an end of life celebration that was really wonderful. The other person that I really need to thank, so I need to thank Sharon Bird really quickly. We did a lot of meals and helped with my mom. And the day she passed, brought over food and just was also very helpful. But Laura Carter was one rock star and the other rock star was Lynn Companion. When my mom first had aphasia, Mrs. Companion helped find the speech person. She did these weekly Zoom sessions because she knows about this and found the person that helped my mom who's a little I don't alternative is not the right word I'd say forward thinking and 
she was incredibly helpful. I'm grateful she got to visit my mom before she passed and was up from South Carolina. I could not have gotten through this without her because she did hospice before she retired. And so I was prepared for the death rattle because of her. I was prepared for the process that happens at the end of life. And she had said, you know, you can see some really incredible things. And she was right. I could not have done again, anything without her. She helped advocate like saying, okay, we know this is the end of life. Can we stop some of these medications for my mom? My mom hated to pills and she just prepared me to be able to face this and she's like if you need me I'm here and the same with Mrs. Carter but Mrs. Companion also gave me a book that was very helpful because it was at end of life when people had died and I would have had if I hadn't been there when my mom passed I would have had incredible guilt had I not read this book so I just say to you if you're meant to be with someone when they die you will be there this, this is like about 50 stories. And after reading, I'm like, oh yeah, if I'm meant to be there, I'll be there. Even if they're dying, people are going to control what's going on in their life. So just know, I hope that someone who's listening maybe needs to hear that and felt guilt. I know when my grandmother died, my brother and I were flying in from Los Angeles and she died. And they said, I talked to her before she died and her eyes opened and what I realized is my aunt Sally and I weren't there. And I thought we would have been the two that would have held her back and said, no, don't go. I'm all sentimental. So I understand why we weren't there. So I just share that if that helps. But anyway, I want to dedicate today's podcast to Laura Carter and Lynn Companion. The truth is, once you learn how to die, you learn how to live. That's from Mitch Album and Tuesdays with Maury. I encourage you to read that book if you hadn't. I read it ages ago. In my view, a good death is individual, just like decluttering and getting organized. And it's the ultimate clearing of clutter and letting go. What works for someone might not work for someone else. According to the Institute of Medicine report published 25 years ago, a good death is one that is, quote, free from avoidable distress and suffering for the patient, family, and caregivers in general accord with the patient's and family's wishes and reasonably consistent with clinical, cultural, and ethical standards, end quote. I thought that was a great summary and wanted to share that. So how do you have a good death? Pain management, I would say, is probably the number one thing based on my experience. The last 24 hours of my mom's life, I stayed up and got up every hour to give her morphine to make sure that she was, wasn't in pain. And what they explained to me, if I remember correctly, one that what we're given at home isn't what you have at the hospital. So it's not as strong. And if it's given every hour, then that makes sure there's, there's no lapse and that she would, wouldn't be in any pain. She had started pain management prior to the last 24 hours, but you know, the body's starting to shut down. I would think, I know that that's what I want. I wanted for her and to not have anyone be in pain and suffer. The other thing is to address any spiritual issues. There might be a crisis of faith or a questioning of it all. And I encourage you to engage in discussion. Maybe for you, that means reading from sacred text have a clergy person. They had clergy people that worked with hospice. We had someone come in and she left books for her to read, but these people are trained with end of life care and to answer your questions. Maybe if they're religious, something like last rites. Address the spiritual issues. And I'm gonna encourage you not to shy away from these conversations. I feel like in this country, we have such a fear of death that we just, like the plastic surgery, I'm going to keep you at bay. And one of the things I said to my mom, again, with aphasia, and as she grew weaker, it was especially hard to understand. And she, her writing, she wasn't able to write for us to understand it as well. But I said, I am going to be with you. I'm going to be holding your hand on the left side. And Justin is going to be holding your hand on the right side. And sure enough, that happened. And I'll never forget hearing that death rattle. The hospice person that we had a on-call hospice person who's like, yeah, I think it's 24 to 48 hours. And I had a sense that my mom was going to die on the 8th. But then as I joked, she was always late. So of course she'd die on the 9th. And the death route I would 
do the morphine with my mom, fall asleep and have the alarm watch set to, to wake me up. And so at 3.30, I texted my brother and I said, I heard the death rattle. And just FYI, I said, I don't think you need to get here right now, but just know. And he said, oh, I can't sleep anyway. I'm going to come up and be over. But I had said to my mom, we're going to do this. You're going to be welcomed by people for your next adventure. And you'll be surrounded by those that love you. She was with my brother and I, my husband, her favorite hair caregiver, who that was her last day. And she was leaving in 15 minutes and my father. Discuss treatment preferences and quality of life. I personally believe after everything that we need a national right to die law. And I'm gonna encourage you to read Being Mortal. It is, there's a link to it on my site under end of life resources. This was written by a doctor and what he went through for his own father. So be really clear on what process you want to happen and what you're willing to do. Now, I, I don't have the particulars, but I know my uncle's partner died a couple of weeks before my mom and I felt his presence. He definitely helped her cross over. But he, these were his last words that my uncle shared on Facebook and that I thought were worth sharing. I would like to have the chance to terminate my life with all my friends and family together saying farewell. I just wish this would be very short. To drag out the process is unkind. I am dehydrated, vital signs deteriorating. My breath is tight and short. My heart is failing, all of which amounts to sitting and waiting for death. For those who oppose my right to decide, please do not consider this an issue of religion. It is an issue of compassion for me as I suffer. I don't believe being faced with death is a religious thing. It is spiritual and factual. Everybody has to face death. Hospice is a good thing. It helps you feel secure and it supplies comfort. But when you first know your terminal, you should be able to choose your time of death. For me, that is a humane thing to do. And that was from Herb Burgess and Herb passed July 29th, a couple weeks before my mom. And I encourage you be aware of your quality of life and what you want. I know I don't wanna be on a ventilator. I don't wanna be in a coma just at this point in life. I've lived a good life. I don't want to, I just am aware of what I want. Resolve any conflicts. You might not be able to. My mom had a sister that she is, even though she's passed, she's still estranged from her. And I said, do you want me to try to find her? Do you have anything you want to say? She didn't. And I think that that's okay. I don't believe that you have to resolve every conflict and don't think you should force that on anyone you know, I was talking with my husband this morning about something. I was like, oh, I should have made another decision. And sometimes in our emotional state, we don't know, but I don't believe that anything is resolved. And so there's conflicts with yourself and it would be more important to get right with yourself in my view than whatever you question. Now, again, I think forgiveness is really great, but not that can't always happen and don't judge it. You do the best you can. And I don't think it's necessary to resolve everything or have forgiveness. I'm not a fan of people. I've heard stories who lead a very immoral life and on their deathbed want forgiveness and they want last rites and they want to be absolved from that. I'm like, well, I don't think your five minute confessional should overrule of life of debauchery. That's just my personal view and resolve what you're able to. And it is what it is. And again, you have to be able to get right, right with yourself. But reading that book of people and needing to see certain things and people trying to resolve things. And it's just really interesting. In one, for instance, the son was gay and the father rejected him. And the mother said, please, he wants to see you before he dies. And the father never came. And so that son, I can't imagine that. I imagine that would have been incredibly painful, but the son had to get right with himself, be okay with himself, and he can't change another person. So I'd say do what you're able, but you can't control another person. As I was doing research for this, I read something that suggested there are four basic messages that a person needs to communicate at the end of life. Now this reminds me of, I can never pronounce it correctly, hope, pana, I know, and 
I love you. Thank you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. I, th I can't remember if that's the same. And so those are, I think maybe thank you. I think, that, I don't know if these are the same thing. So they're, I love you. Thank you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. We celebrated my mom of Christmas. So we did Christmas in July, which when I lived in the national parks, that was something that we celebrated. And so we all wrote letters to her and she was still in good enough shape to read them. And I have to laugh. My husband wrote probably the shortest lover letter ever, but my mom put a smiley face. I had a little joke about fighting the good fight. And uh, that put a chuckle on her, which was really nice. I know we all had humor in our letters and I think that that's really important. And we all took turns talking to her privately the day she died, which I think was uh, really great. And we were able to call people like Laura Carter. And I was able to put the phone up for Lynn to tell mom goodbye and very grateful for that. But I love you. Thank you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. And I know those were things that I put in my letter and I felt good. I felt I left everything on the table. I couldn't have done anymore. And so I'm grateful for that. Do you keep saying that you'll have the life you desire someday, but someday never comes? Have you been feeling like your clutter owns you? Looking for a little more support that's budget friendly? We'll be doing weekly take actions and creating a community to move you forward so you can discover joy and freedom. Visit Declutter Your Life with Julie Caraccio on Patreon to learn more or Find the link on reawakenyourbrilliance.com. Try and honor wishes that are doable. Now you can't do everything. We talked, we did Christmas in July because she loved that. She died 15 days later. Could do it at home. I got a snow maker, it was awesome. And I think she really got a kick out of that, but made this great fluffy snow. So make sure you can do it before you promise anything. And make sure it's what the person really wants and not someone else. Don't try to force your wishes or what you think need to be done. I have heard some interesting stories around that. So try and honor what you can. My mom didn't express that she wished to have a final Christmas, but we knew that that was her favorite season. She still had the Santas up from the 2020 Christmas. So do what you're able to. Talk about what they found meaning doing. It might be about all the people they loved and loved them. My mom was so loved and she was so much fun. I did not get her fun personality, unfortunately, but eh, what are you gonna do? Sybil, who's like a second mother to me, and I'd encourage you, years ago I put this interview up, but Sybil was a really incredible human being. And I encourage you to listen to that. People can talk about how they've made a difference. Sybil touched so many lives. One of the things when I visit her twice a year and she would save baskets, she had a basket of letters she would save that people had written to her. And when she was feeling down, she'd pull them out. And I was grateful that a couple of my letters made it in. But you could tell what an incredible life Sybil led and touched so many people. And I found out lots of things after my mom passed and how she had touched people in ways I didn't know about. Maybe volunteering was important to them. Maybe being the best teacher they could be. Maybe they were a sports person and being physically fit gave them purpose and meaning. Have those conversations. Number eight, let people say what they need to say. Respect the process. There's no right or wrong here. Sometimes people need to get stuff off their chest. They're not going to act on it most likely, but they need to express it. I need to say you hurt me. I need to say I'm angry and here's why. And then that can sometimes lead to resolving some conflicts. If people are allowed to express how they feel, that is the first step to getting that done. And you know, sometimes people just need to scream and share that. You know, my mom said on more than one occasion, she wanted to die. I didn't say stop that. Uh, the first time she said it, I cried. And I said, I don't want you to die, but I, I respect your process. Well, I have to laugh, everyone. If it seemed like a 
stilted or a weird transition because I was recording and bam, I've never had this happen. Uh, maybe mama wasn't happy what I was talking about or the direction I was going on or wanted me to take a pause that the computer just bam, completely shut down. I have never had that happen. I've had the power go out once during an interview, but it managed to stay recorded. This was completely different. Thankfully it was recorded. So back to our list, number nine, let the dying person have control. Trust me, they will. I talked about earlier, they will, if they want you there when they go to the next adventure, they will have you. If they don't, they won't. If they're able to communicate, see what they need. Some people want solitude. In that book I read, this person had 24 seven caregivers, but wanted to pass on her own. And the one time when the on-call caregiver, the person who was there and the new caregiver was coming to relieve her, needed help with heavy equipment, she passed. See how conscious they are. They want, might wanna sleep or be very aware. My mom slept three days, Sybil did as well. Sybil's last word, this is great. Take me now, take me now, take me now. When my friend, her grandson told me that, I was like, yeah, I'm not surprised. That sounds very civil like My mom opened her eyes shortly before she died, said she was blind at this point. She looked up at the corner and we just kept talking through her the entire time. But if they're able to see what they need, let them control that. It's about them and their process. It's not about you. Was it tough hearing my mom wanted to die? Absolutely, but I had to respect it. And finally, number 10, let your intuition guide you. I had mentioned that the one, the regular hospice nurse had said it would be two weeks to two months. And I'm like, no, mm -mm, that's mm -mm, not happening. The other on call was like, yeah, I think 24 to 48 hours. And my intuitively, I felt she was gonna die that Sunday because my niece Claire was in a play. And I said, Claire, I just can't, I just, I just need to be with mom. And so trust your intuition and use that intuition in starting conversations, seeing what they need, trusting maybe if they were like my mom and can't communicate and being open to that and seeing if that can help guide you. Our intuition's there for a reason. Planning a good death. Again, we don't know what our number's called, how that's gonna happen. But if you're able to plan, it helps give you peace of mind. So think about what does a good death look like to you? Sybil wanted to be wheeled out and she was so she could see her garden. We had started to do that with my mother. We're going to wheel her out, except that she was in a hospital bed. Anyway, they were going to bring in another hospital bed and switch them out. But we just decided it was easier since she'd been sleeping just to keep her there. You're going to have medical considerations. You want to make sure this is written out. This is super important. You want a medical power of attorney. Now this might be under just one power of attorney, but sometimes people have the separated. Be very, very clear about this. You also need to be aware if you end up in a religious hospital that's affiliated with a church, they might not honor your end of life wishes. So that's just an FYI. Like I've said, if I pull the plug, I don't want to be in a coma, just pull it. I'm going to be very clear about that. I don't want to take, my mom had signed they turned off her defibrillator, which if I understand correctly, it wouldn't restart her heart. I will say the wrong thing medically. And that was really hard for me. I started crying and had to leave. They had me read explaining everything. And one of the worst times I felt, cause I thought you got to support her and be there. And I had to let Olivia, who's one of her really wonderful caregivers read it. And it didn't kill her right there, obviously, but you know, it was signing off and she had the pulse. It was in bright pink on the fridge saying like, I don't want crazy stuff to keep me alive. So have all of that, have your living will, your end of life care, what you want, the physician's order for life sustaining treatment. That's what pulse stands for. Write out everything, make them known. I cremated my mom because she and my dad had had several conversations about that and that that's what she wanted. I think she was afraid of dying. and. One of the things that the grief process has helped me with 
and seeing signs that she's still around, that she's at peace now. Because I struggle with that. I still struggle with that a little bit. Just be very clear in what you want. And then we'll just trust that it's honored. But I've just, I hope by the time it's my time, if I'm in a situation, I would be able to make the decision to take morphine or whatever it is that you can do. Because I just, I don't want to lollygag around. And like Herb said, you know, it's painful. It's, he's having trouble breathing. No one wants to stick around like that. How can you prepare to help someone else have a good death? Like in life, be as present as possible. As hard as it was, it was a wonderful experience. I had to be present to advocate for my mom. I talked about this a moment ago. We're like, let's move to the living room. She can see her plants. And I was like, you know what? No, she needs to stay put. And we just need to have her in her bedroom. I just had a strong feeling about that. Just being with the person is something. One of the times I felt truly present and in the moment because there was nothing that I could do, but I know she knew that I was there. I was just present. There wasn't anything else I could do, but I know that she felt that and I know that that made a difference. Our body might be shutting down, but we're still there. Our soul, our spirit is still there, attuned to all of it. Know everything that's going on. You know, you can read those interesting books about people who have died and come back to life. You can say, I heard the conversations. I could see them resuscitating me. I could see all that. I could feel all that. I'll never forget the story when I was in LA that was in a magazine. And a woman had, I guess she had died temporarily, but but traffic had stopped. And it wasn't in the particular situation where it's was for me but I always remembered it moving forward and she said she could hear people saying jump just get on with it oh my god and be late and she said and she heard one person praying for her and her spirit I guess flew over I don't remember all the details but that always stuck with me they know what's going on we sense all that create a sacred space you can do this in a hospital maybe it's an incense or a candle I'll if they're an oxygen you can't have a candle or reading from the Bible or spiritual text or sharing what you love to them or fond memories. One of the things we did, my mom loved to travel. And so Justin found at Target, a big map and we put pins in it. We wrote down, oh, all the places that she traveled. Holding your hand. My brother and I held my mom's hand. My dad was at the foot of the bed and Hannah was next to him. And my husband was next to me. We were able to create I call it holding space. So I held space for love, a peaceful transition, and for people to support me. And I have to tell you, I mentioned earlier, it was crazy. It's like I could feel these angelic presences, these huge, the one was at the head of her bed and one was at the foot and the room was crowded. And one of the things when I had conversations, I was like, well, you know, I think mother and daddy will be there and Athena my cat I've asked for to greet you I've asked Sybil and she knew Sybil I'm like I've asked Sybil to come I felt Herb's present but I I don't know Maple and Alan I know were there but I was overwhelmed at the number of people there to greet greet her just know whatever that means it can if you don't have a candle or you can't have a candle or incense you can hold that space and create something sacred for transition Provide physical comfort. I mentioned this all the way in the beginning about pain management. For pain, for breathing. Maybe their skin gets irritated. My mom got sores because of uh, being bed, bed sores. Bag bomb is what Mrs. C recommended. So at the end, that's what we were using. Ice chips. I put a washcloth on her lips and would squeeze some of the water to help try to keep her from being completely dehydrated maybe it's turning on their side if they're uncomfortable feed the bite you know maybe bites of food if you can I know my mom didn't eat the last three days near the end watch your temperature if they're keeping you know they keep looks like they're moving the blanket they're probably too hot if they're hunching their shoulders or moving around maybe they're shivering that they're too cold and again touch I think touch is so important hold their hand listen I'm reading this book that I started when 
the day I was feeling sad and it's the exact words when I heard when she passed. And so I've been reading the different stories and some people, they just go in their sleep. I was shocked by that. My friend said, oh, they're the grandmother. They didn't even realize she had passed. I thought, wow, because when I heard the death rattle, it was loud. It, I mean, I dozed off. It was, and I was like, dang, it was super loud. And I'm deaf and it was super loud. But people go different ways. And so just be there, listen. Maybe they can say something right before they die. Just listen. Consider soft music, low lights. You know, if there's any music they particularly enjoyed, have that on. Talk to them. They are still there, not about them. I've said it a couple of times, hearing's the last to go. Let them have their experience. I know I saw angels and felt spirits of many people and some of you aren't gonna believe that, that's okay. I didn't talk about it until after she went. I wasn't like, oh, hey, I can see angel or wow, the room's crowded. I wanted my mom to have her own experience. It was about her, it was her journey. The entire time, the five of us just talked and held hands. They said, mom, it's okay. We love you, we're gonna be okay. We're going to take care of each other. You know, it's, you know what? Oh, you can be social again. You're going to be able to talk. I said, if you need to get a message, Beth and Barrett, that's our conduit. And they described, Barrett described as my mom being right now, like this old fashioned telephone operator. You know, they have to plug in and do the old switchboard. And she's trying everything out and contacting people. Mrs. C had shared, she had a very vivid dream with my mom. In it. And I have no doubt it was my mom contacting her and visiting her. It never convinced me otherwise. My brother just got back from a trip and he said, oh yeah, we saw a butterfly. My brother, my brother thinks I'm the weird one in the family. And I'd written this post on Facebook about how my mom loved butterflies. And she had some in her bathroom that I now have in my bathroom. And they keep showing up. The other day I'd been in her bedroom thousands of times. And my niece was occupying the downstairs bathroom. Like I'm just gonna run these my parents. So I sit on the toilet. And I look up and there's this incredible butterfly painting that she had put above the door. I'm like, I've been in that bathroom thousands of times. That's a wink and a nod from my mom. So I was like, dad, I know I went through the paintings, but I'd really like this butterfly one. Get a break. Caregiving is tough. Find a support group. I had my alumni, Mount Holyoke, they have a caregiver support group. Couldn't have done with that on there. Fantastic. Have your friends help call on hospice. Hospice is a great resource. And if you have some extra cash and they do a great job, consider donating. If you're able to afford to hire caregivers, that can make a huge difference. It is exhausting. I have no regrets about what I did. And I had a lot of support and we had caregivers and I was still exhausted. You know, my dad was really good about take a break. My husband was like, take a break. The feeling overwhelmed at times but you've got to take care of yourself to be able to care for someone else. Give reassurances. Okay, this is, I'm going to tell you a weird thing. I, at this point, Tony and I need to hash it out a little more, but I want to be cremated. I was thinking, ah, if he wants to be shot in space, I'll be a sport and do that with him. Although we would be cremated for that too. And so my instructions are going to be, and I laugh because in the hospice book, that Mrs. Companion gave me, they had a story about this. And I said, oh, I'm not the only person. That's me. Oh, I feel so much better. Because I personally believe, talking with a friend the other day, reincarnation, I've been to this planet before, but I'm also doing the multiverse like theory that you are, here I am in 2021, but my life in 1560 is going on. My life in 3032 is going on. And so I'm like, I know I've experienced some unpleasant deaths. I said, and my instructions are going to say, I will, if I go with cremation, make sure I'm dead. Wait a couple hours. Whatever you do, just please make sure that you're willing to make sure that I am actually super dead when they throw me in the oven to cremate me. It's like when they used to, the 1800s, they have the bell in case you're buried alive. I know something like that happened. You just, it gets me, creeps me out big time. But one of my things is going to do, uh, have a cup of coffee, have some cocoa. I'll try to bake ahead and have something in the freezer you can take out. And 
they had the hospice come and, and do some things to help prepare. And then the funeral home came and I just sat with her the entire time and held her hand until they kicked me out. Um, and I asked the hospice nurse, okay, she's dead. Right. And I said to Justin, she said, he's like, yeah, she stopped breathing. And so, um, it's a little quirk of mine, but I'm going to ask that whoever's with me give reassurances. And I'll put that note out for the other side to tell me that too. And tell them things. I'll take care of your pet, your plants, your kids, whatever it is, is going to help them know. I'm like, we said, I'm going to be okay. It's, you can go now. We're going to be okay. We're going to take care of ourselves. Just reassure, make that transition to the next adventure as easy and them as possible. And remember, it's their journey, not yours. Your day will come someday, eventually. We know that, like what, death and taxes guaranteed? Take actions from today's podcast. Contemplate your mortality and what matters most. I'm going to add, contemplate your morality because that I stumbled on that word several times, so I feel like I need to share that. Understand what a good death looks like to you. Plan and prepare for dying. Make your wishes known in a legal document and with loved ones. Know how you can support someone in having a quality dying process. On our next episode, we're talking about what you put out, you get back. Go out, clear your clutter to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. Clearing your clutter allows you to share your gifts with the world. Get your free self-assessment to discover your clutter priority at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. If you've enjoyed Clear Your Clutter Inside and Out, please rate, review, and share us.